Dr. Amoris could only hear his heavy breathing as he labored against the current trying to swim out of the opening. His flashlight dimmed against the cave walls and his feet kicked as hard as he could manage, but it was just not enough to propel his body further. At the age of 68, Dr. Amoris spent his retired years in his home country of the Philippines enjoying his extreme hobby, cave diving. He was exploring the Hinatuan Enchanted River when the fight for his life occurred. This is his story. The Hinatuan Enchanted River, also known as the Sacred River, is a saltwater spring on the island of Dinagat in the Philippines. It's a picture-perfect, beautiful place with crystal-clear water that is mesmerizing. The locals respect and admire the river, believing it had mysterious and magical properties. It is said that mythical spirits live in the river and can change into both human and animal forms, similar to shapeshifters in Native American stories. People also say that the fish in the river are too smart to be caught by any fishing method like nets or hooks, and that the river is protected by these supernatural beings. The Hanatuan Enchanted River is just under 985 feet long, making it more like a large spring than a real river. Despite its size, it is very grand and beautiful. The river starts from an 80-foot deep hole on its western end and flows into a brackish estuary near the Philippine Sea. Its clear waters show many colors like emerald green, turquoise, purple, and many shades of blue giving its enchanted name. The changing of colors is actually due to the depth, light, and the makeup of the river's banks and bottom. The river is mostly surrounded by thick, tropical plants like vines and ferns, which block a lot of the sunlight. Under the water, the river is much more complicated than it looks from above. For years, scientists and divers tried to find where the spring's water came from but couldn't. In 1999, a diver named Alex Santos found a narrow passageway at the bottom of the deepest pool. This passage led to an unmapped network of caves, channels, and chambers that supplied the spring with water and acted as a natural filter, keeping the water clear all year round. Alex Santos didn't explore very far into the cave. In fact, it would be more than 10 years later until the first detailed exploration happened in February 2010 by Dr. Amoris and two other members of the Filipino cave divers. They slipped through the narrow opening one by one and found a series of large chambers connected by narrow passageways. They named one of these passageways Doc's Door, which is made up of a bunch of branches and logs blocking part of the entrance. Apart from that, there is a mayor's chamber which is big, about 120 feet long, 100 feet wide and 26 feet high at its tallest point. There are two different passageways that lead to this chamber. One is called Bernal's Crawl and the other one is Patrice's Way. Inside the mayor's chamber, there are areas including Calvin's kneecap and Paul's passage. Dr. Amoris and his team were fascinated by the cave system and believed it was much bigger than they had thought. They made five separate dives to explore it. Although they couldn't explore the entire cave complex, their findings helped scientists understand the cave structure and how the water flowed through it. Dr. Amoris felt he had only seen a small part of the cave system and promised to come back someday to continue exploring. For cave divers, entering the Enchanted River Cave is easier than exiting. This is because the current is flowing into the depths of the cave, which helps them swim in. But to leave, one must swim against the strong current on the way out. These kind of underwater caves are called siphons, and they are typically harder and more dangerous to explore. Divers have to use more energy and oxygen at the end of their dive when they are already tired and running low on gas. Dr. Alfonso Docboy Amoris was a microsurgeon and reconstructive surgery specialist who returned to the Philippines to retire after spending 20 years in the US. But instead of relaxing, he chose to explore caves pushing the boundaries with extreme cave diving and age. Born into a large family in the Philippines, Dr. Amoris exhibited a passion for exploration from a young age. Aside from being an advanced cave diver, he piloted his seaplane and skied on challenging slopes. Even though he was strong, active, and healthy, Amoris was diagnosed with a heart condition at the age of 40. However, 
he didn't let this slow him down or stop his plans. He became a respected member of the American Board of Surgery and the American College of Surgeons. Despite his busy career, he made time for hobbies like cave diving. While in the US, he earned his cave diving certification from the National Association of Cave Divers in Florida. Amores liked being in the United States, but as he got older, he missed his home country, the Philippines, so he decided to go back. There, he performed free surgeries, educated children about medicine, coral reefs, and marine sanctuaries. Eventually, he helped start the Filipino Cave Diver Association and would become its leader. When he first started, not many people in the Philippines were into cave diving, but the creation of the association led to more and more folks getting interested. At the beginning, it was tough for Amores because not many people wanted to join him on risky dives. Therefore, he often had to dive by himself. Many advanced cave divers will warn anyone of the risk of diving alone, especially in extreme conditions. In 2002, Amores wanted to provide something he had been thinking about for a while. He observed that the climates in land in southern Florida were similar to his home on Mokton Island, so he believed they might have similar underwater caves. That year, he found the Pawad underwater cave system on the island. After this big dive, he told a local reporter how incredible it felt to explore a hidden cave that had been untouched for thousands of years. Even though Amori's achieved something big, he was ready for more challenges. This is when he made the switch from regular scuba gear to something more complicated called closed circuit rebreathers. These rebreathers are harder to use, but let divers stay underwater longer. After completing a tough course, Amori's got certified to teach others how to use these special rebreathers. In early June of 2014, Amori's with his friend went on a night dive on Mokton Island. Later that night, they got ready for Amori's upcoming dives at the Enchanted River. His friend could see how excited Amori's was to go back after so long, hoping his trip would be even better than the last one, inciting his anticipation of discovering something new. Amori's and his buddies knew they'd face lots of challenges, especially when they had to leave the cave after each dive. They had to swim against the strong siphons in the openings. Additionally, Dr. Amori's and his team faced added pressure as they guided an underwater water film crew tasked with documenting their expedition for a television show. On Tuesday, June 17, 2014, Amores and his team spent the morning getting their gear ready and going over their dive plan. It was their second dive of the trip, but today, they were just looking around the cave to find good spots for filming. The film crew wasn't going to dive until the next day. They put on their diving gear and went into the clear water over the deepest part of the spring. They started descending toward the narrow entrance about 130 feet below. At approximately 100 feet, they encountered Doc's door, which was partially blocked by logs and branches, further on facing two diverging passages towards the mayor's chamber. Amores directed his students towards Bernal's crawl. However, excessive dirt restricted visibility near the entrance, and the powerful current thwarted their attempt to swim through. Diving during low tide amplified the force of the water gushing out, as there was no incoming tide to counterbalance it. They decided to try the second passage, called Patrice's Way. The current there was still strong, but it was a bit easier to handle. Amori signaled for his students to go in one by one because the passage was narrow and they couldn't all fit together. It was tough, but the students pushed through and finally made it into the beautiful chamber, feeling rewarded for their efforts. Amoris followed after them, but it took him a long time to kick his way through. By the time he got into the chamber, he was already fatigued. Getting into the cave had been more difficult than originally anticipated. That meant they used up more of their oxygen than they had planned, and they still had the toughest part of the dive ahead of them. Amoris could have decided to call off the dive, and it would have been totally understandable. As their leader, it was his job to figure out the correct and safest things to do in the moment. Safety is the most important thing in diving, and they could always try again another day when the tide was better. But Amores might have felt pressured to keep going because of the film team schedule. He had a reputation for keeping his word, both personally and professionally. Instead of giving up on the dive and waiting for better conditions, he and his two students kept going into Mayor's chamber. They passed through Calvin's kneecap and Paul's passage before starting to go up at a 45 degree angle to about 285 feet. At this point, Amores made a smart choice to end the dive. They were already tired and running low on oxygen, and the most difficult part of the dive was still ahead. Now they'd have to fight against the current to get out of the cave. 
When they got back to Doc's door, student Jamie Lack was surprised when Amori signaled for him to swim out first. Normally, since Amori's was the last to go into the cave, he should have been the first one out. There could have been a few reasons for this. Maybe Amori's didn't want to leave his students behind, or he might have known he wasn't strong enough to make it out first and didn't want them to waste their energy trying to save him. Whatever the reason, the students knew they had to follow Amori's order without question. He was the most experienced diver, so they trusted he had a good reason for changing the exit order. As they tried to leave through Doc's door, the current was incredibly difficult, pushing against them the entire way. Jamie noticed that Amori's wasn't kicking his legs as hard as he should have been, and when he signaled that he was ready to go through, Amori's didn't respond like he normally would. This was strange and a little worrying because they were close to each other and could see each other clearly even with the strong current. The younger and stronger students managed to push through the narrow underwater passage and reach a safer, deep pool where they could see the surface. Amoris tried many times to follow them, but each time he tried, he got pushed further away from the exit. Jamie, who was watching from the other side, wanted to help his friend and teacher, but he was also tired, running out of air, and knew that going back could be very dangerous. Even though Jamie and the other diver were still students, they were experienced. Amoris wouldn't have taken them on the trip if he didn't trust them. They had learned to always stay safe, even in dangerous situations, and now they had to use that training to make the most difficult decision. They finally came up to the surface in the Enchanted River about 75 minutes after going into the water, but sadly, they had to leave someone they cared about very much behind. Amoris must have felt many emotions as he watched his students swim away into the deep, dark water. On one hand, he might have realized that without their help, he had almost no chance of surviving. Still, he tied himself to the safety line. Maybe he did this to rest and then try one last time to get out the cave. Another idea is that he tied himself to the line so rescuers could find his body easily. If that was the case, he knew he wasn't going to make it. Meanwhile, on the surface, his tired and shocked students climbed out of the water and quickly told authorities that Amoris was missing in the cave. Amoris' wife, son, daughters, and siblings rushed to the area, but by the time rescue divers arrived, everyone knew he was probably dead. The conditions at the cave entrance were still difficult, as silt obstructed visibility just like hours before. Since going into the cave would be very dangerous, the rescuers had to wait until it was safer to start the search. Finally, after the conditions approved and an 8 hour search, Amoris' body was found about 130 feet inside the cave. The autopsy showed that he had died from a heart attack. His age and heart condition may have made the dive too dangerous, especially since it was a difficult dive. In hindsight, many claim that Dr. Amoris should have turned around immediately after noticing the entrance to the cave was more difficult than expected. But sadly, that did not happen and the story serves as a reminder to those who are brave enough to venture into the siphon. His body would be returned to his family, where his wife and kids mourn the loss of a loved one. The Filipino diving community in particular suffered a huge blow with the loss of Dr. Amoris, as he was a pioneer of the sport in his country. However, his legacy still lives on, as cave diving in his home has become more and more popular.